All right, so and then continue on with that chain of thoughts here. I want to talk a little bit about the next evolution of what would happen if you start getting in with difficult people. Typically what you see pop up are threats. Threats used in the negotiation process. We do not see a lot of threats in the real estate world once again because of the intermediary between the agents and their high emotional intelligence that typically won't allow that kind of concept. Now, in dealing with negotiations in general, there could be threats. And threats usually take the form of an if-then. If some action occurs, then some penalty. We use these as adults with children, right? If you don't do your homework, then no Xbox. That is a threat. If you fail to take the trash out, then you don't get dinner. <laughs> uh, that's not really a threat. And kids know that, by the way. So if you've got young kids, don't let, you're never going to get away with that one. But you get what I'm talking about, okay? Threats are typically used in the form of punishment, not conceding. All right, so do not confuse those two. A threat is typically given in the form of a punishment. That would be the then some action, then no Xbox, then you don't get to borrow the car. It is not a conceding. A conceding is obviously where you give in. So you want to make sure that you understand that, that those two are not the same. A punishment is a threat. When there's a punishment that's involved, it's typically a threat. I have seen buyers before that have written an offer that got rejected and then down the road the sellers came back and said, hey look, we couldn't work that deal. Are you guys still interested in buying? And I've had a client say, yes, let's write an offer, another offer, but we are going to lower the price now five grand. So in, the, in effect, it was a threat or it was a punishment that came from the buyer by them not taking his first offer, you know, three weeks ago. Um, now, the thing you have to understand is the threat coming from an emotion or are they trying to use it as a strategy, all right? And as an adult with children, this is the best example. It actually can come from both. A lot of times we use it as a strategy for an action. Once again, if you don't take the trash out, you don't get to play on the Xbox tonight. That is a strategy that a parent use to force an activity. That can be used in negotiation as a strategy. If it is an emotion, then it becomes much harder to control from both sides of the table. If someone's knee-jerk reaction is to, well, if they don't want to pay it, then screw them, we're not going to deal with it. That could be an emotional issue. The good thing about emotional threats is typically once time passes and they cool down, that emotional threat can go away. Now, I have seen emotional threats turn into strategies where they've said something and then later when they became of a much cooler demeanor have decided to, you know, that was a good idea. We're going to keep that to force an activity. So understand that is your client threatening from an emotion and threatening from a strategy? And this is one of the few cases where I will go out on a limb here and even record it by saying that sometimes listening to your client is not the best thing to do. Now, this is a very fine line and I would not suggest you just take the carte blanche and walk away and say, well, Raymond said not to listen to a client. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying once you become versed enough and skilled enough in the negotiation process, you will be able to discern if that threat was an emotion or was it a strategy? Typically, the easiest way to tell is how it was delivered and the time frame that it was delivered. 
if you call your client and go, hey, we got an offer that's 100000 below this price, and they blow up and start yelling and say, well, if they don't want to play our game, then screw them. We're not going to deal with them. That's an emotional threat, all right? The good, that is a case of where you would most likely go, okay, I understand that. Uh, have a good day. And then tomorrow you might call them back and go, hey, you know, we still got this buyer. What should we decide to do with them? Where you completely let them vent and argue and understand that it was an emotion. And that probably is not going to be your guidance. Probably in an hour, two, next day, they're either going to contact you or you're going to follow up and they're going to go, hey, look, okay, let's counter offer back and so and so and do that. Okay, that's your true answer. Now, if it's a strategy where you say, like, look, I want to close and if they can't close by the end of the month, then we can't offer that price because I need to be out of my apartment. If I go over one more day, I got to rent another month and it's going to cost me money. So let's write the offer that says if they close by so-and-so, then, you know, so it could be a strategy and typically strategies are well thought out and given with an emotional intelligence, not an emotional barrage. Now, the only problem with a threat is that it tends to elicit a counter threat. And typically counter threats escalate in the size of the threat. Now, I'm not going to give you an example because there are so many variables here that it's hard to discern. If you said, I would, I'm not going to do this, then we'll do that. And then they come back and go, oh yeah, well then here's what we're going to offer. That counter threat has now dwarfed your threat. Your only response at this point is now you make another threat that dwarfs their counter threat. So you can see how this threat can escalate into a bad situation that could potentially spiral all out of control. And one of the things you need to understand with that threat is who's actually paying for the threat. And what I mean by that is if you've got a buyer that wants to offer something very low and the seller sees that as a threat, but yet they've got five or six other buyers, is the your buyer actually paying for that in the form of not getting the property? So the fact that he could be making a threat could actually ultimately backfire and he's the one that ends up paying for it rather than the seller on the other side. If you don't take my offer, then I'm going to walk away. Um, you see buyers all the time. This is my last or highest offer. Okay. Maybe it's not. And they're using that as a strategy. Now that didn't take the form of an if then. But virtually, that's what it is. I mean, if you said, here's my offer, it's one time, it's good for 24 hours, and I'm going to offer no more. That, in essence, is a threat. The seller may say, well, screw you, I'm not dealing with you, go away. Now, he has dwarfed your threat by calling it, and the buyer now has to either rescind on the threat or literally walk away, and if he walks away, then in essence, he's not getting the property. So who paid for that threat? Okay, so I will tell you that threats are typically never a good idea when dealing in the real estate world because of the number of potential buyers that are out there. It is hard to make an illicit threat as a buyer to a seller and get it to stand up in a situation where there are five other buyers waiting in line for them, okay? <clears throat> now, while you're in that negotiation, you have to remember that there are professional opinions to help your side of the table negotiate, and there are personal opinions. And what's the old adage about opinions are like, and you get what I'm saying, a professional opinion is one that you would make in the guise of being their agent, looking out for the best for them. 
where a perf- personal opinion might be your own thought with no respect or no um, insight as to what they're looking for. I would suggest that you never, ever, ever make personal opinions. A professional opinion is quite acceptable. And what I mean by that is if somebody would say, well, I really love this house in Mooresville. It's got three bedrooms that what, what we wanted, what do you think? You don't want to say something like, well, I would never live in the dinky town of Mooresville to begin with. That would be more of a personal opinion. That's going to be construed as argumentative or combative against your client and may cost you a client. A professional opinion would be more like, hey, I think that this house is a good value for what they're asking in the neighborhood. I think it serves the purpose that you told me you wanted to buy a house with a bedroom for each child. I think this is probably a good idea. All right, that would be more of a professional opinion. You also have to understand there's this thing called puffing. Some states do not allow puffing. Puffing is an exaggerated form of that. For example, the one I would love to use is someone goes, well, isn't that the toxic dump right over there in our backyard? Ah, yes, but it's, this is the best view of the toxic dump there is. <laughs> that would be puffing, all right? You always want to make sure you disclose facts. Hey, here's the fact. There, you can never get in trouble for disclo- disclosing the fact. What you can't do is commit fraud. Fraud is where you intentionally misrepresent some statements to sway a person's opinion, which could include omission of statements. Understand that there's this thing called lying and then there's this thing called lying by omission. Lying by omission is where you don't give all of the facts to slant the picture. So for example, if someone says, is that backyard corn or oats? And you say, well, it's oats, but you know that next year it's going to be torn down and they're going to build houses because your HOA has already told everybody and you know that, did you lie to that person by not giving them all of the facts? Oh, but next year, that's going to be a toxic waste dump. Uh, My clients have the letter from the HOA stating that. That would be a fact versus committing fraud. Fraud is I lie to you or I intentionally omit issues that could potentially be construed as slanting a person's decision because they do not have all of the uh, knowledge of the facts. They don't have all of the facts. All right. Now we talked a minute ago about the negotiation for real estate agents. There's a couple of ones. Here's one called the counselors of real estate or CRE. Sorry, I had to get a drink of coffee. The CRE is really a good designation in my opinion. It is a professional organization that you must be invited to. You cannot solicit and join this CRE without another member actually inviting you. And one of the requirements is that you must have at least 10 years of experience. So obviously you've got some years before you can even be available to be invited. That is an organization that is known for its leadership and professionalism and high ethical standards. And their whole point is to identify the trends in real estate that's going to affect what's going on now. So they're like a guiding or a governing body to help all of the other agents understand what's going to happen. To be invited to the CRE is quite an honor. And you can learn more about it if you'd like, if you want to go to uh, <clears throat> CRE.org. Okay. Now, <clears throat> negotiation techniques are something that are a learned skill. They're not genetic. You're not born with the ability. People say that all the time. Well, I'm born with that. Or, you know, I've always been good. It is a learned technique. And there are many ways to learn that. There are courses, there are books, uh, there are groups that help you learn, there are debates 
like speaking clubs, all of these things can sharpen or hone your negotiation skill. Don't forget that there are several types of negotiation techniques like the competitive and the collaborative and the uh, conceding. So you must understand how to work within all of them. And those actually have a degree that which helps the deal evolve. You may start out in competitive and slide into the collaborative mode once you buyer and seller become more familiar with each other and they understand what the other's trying to do. And I told you that, that you could go back and forth between these and typically as the process evolves, you will see the mode switch. Another important factor that we discussed on was realize that other cultures may have different negotiation techniques, you know, based upon their ethnic background, their culture, their religion. You must understand those if you plan on being involved in one of those emerging markets. And you as an agent must learn to adapt to their culture and then be able to translate that culture into what is considered the norm for the real estate world, okay? Now, here's some things that I think would be uh, great for you guys to do, is gain some experience in education and negotiation, all right? One of my running statements is always, more education is better than less, and I don't really care what that is. Uh, the reality is true. If you learn how to glass blow, that's going to be a better education and more knowledge than not learning how to do it. So all education is better than less. Um, seek out some training and videos and members and get advice from your managing broker or other agents in your uh, <clears throat> company that you see are doing a lot of deals. Obviously, they understand negotiation. So ask them to maybe help you out. Even role play with that other person. Go through a couple of scenarios on how they would deal with someone that maybe has a different cultural background or someone that is difficult to deal with. Play out a role and literally ask them, hey, I want you to intentionally be hard to deal with so that I can see what it's going to be like and get some practice. Um, ask them how they negotiate. What typically is their modus operandi? Do they deal from a position of power? Do they like clients that have a, a high emotional intelligence? Are there people they fired during the negotiation? What negotiations broke down and why do you think that happened? So in essence, you can interview office mates to figure out what happened in their particular situation. All right, I want to thank you for joining the 30-hour post-licensing course. We've still got a couple more lessons to go. This has been the negotiation section. And as always, feel free to contact me if you've got questions or you want to maybe do some role-playing. I have no trouble doing that. Uh, that sharpens my skills and gets me better as long as helping you as well. So email me at raymond at realuniversity.com. We're going to come back and start a new lesson coming right up.